afternoon. Good Thursday afternoon. It is the 16th. We are 3 p.m. live on the dot. We are on time, ready to go. And of course, I'm going to allow everybody a couple seconds to uh, get on, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for the support this year. After this presentation, I am done, done for the year and uh, just going to enjoy the, the uh, family, some festivities and holiday seasonal activities. Uh, they're all done with school. Uh, our boy from Washington State University is flying down here. Brennan, he'll be here uh, tomorrow. Uh, everybody is out of school. And uh, matter of fact, I just got a phone call from one of them that they needed picked up, but we're about to do this instead. So <laughs> the season is here. And thank you so much for the support this year. It's been a lot of fun to talk about where we are today, where we've been going and how everything is going to be in the future. And we've been doing that for quite some time. And when you look at all the data and the charts and the stats, it's not a surprise. It's like driving down the road and you know exactly where you're going by looking at everything that you need to look at. It's not a lot of speculation when you're looking at a lot, a lot of data and charts and and all that good information. But I'm going to go, we're going to go ahead and get started. Just wanted to say hello to everybody. I see some hi Stevens from Patricia and Anthony and Faye. Happy holidays, Mike and Deborah. I just want to go ahead and get started. This is not like the usual housing debrief. I'm going to get right into the meat of it. Some people are going to have to rewind and, and uh, take a look at uh, uh, what I was talking about, but I want to go ahead and get started with the Southern California 2022 forecast and housing update as to where we are today. So uh, let's see. So of course I wanna thank our sponsor, our sponsor who has been with us the entire year and even uh, part of last year is Kevin Buddy. My buddy, your buddy, buddy Kevin Buddy at Monarchos Financial. Uh, he, of course, deals with more than one kind of borrower, so there's more than one kind of loan. Everything from full documentation loans to alternative documentation loans to investor financing and private money. So everything from full doc, private money, all that in between as well. He has loads and loads of experience. He's been doing this since 1976, helping out realtors and their clients and just about everybody under the sun. He's done such a great job and he's a friend of mine. Did uh, Recently did our refinance and it was absolutely flawless. Can't recommend him more. My buddy, your buddy, Kevin Buddy at Monarchos Financial. And you can contact him at 949-422-2075. That's 949-422-2075. All righty. So I just have a couple funny things. Uh, this is so true, especially in our household. Uh, oftentimes we'd lose that remote. Wouldn't this be great? They do this with bathroom keys. So you don't root, lose the bathroom keys. So <laughs> about had it with losing remotes. How about my boss hat and I had an ugly sweater competition. <laughs> Love that. Uh, <clears throat> now this speaks to the housing market. This is your listing about 90 minutes after it goes live on the MLS. Uh, it is true today, what it was true uh, in October, when this has been true the entire year, uh, it has just been extremely busy uh, the entire year, it hasn't slowed down. Excited for, all, for the holidays, we bought a gingerbread house to decorate and it already has six offers. <laughs> Gotta love it. So let's get into the 2021 review. Kind of want to talk about where we've been and I'm going to do it with some reports that I picked out. Blazing beginning, that was the very start of this year. We had the hottest housing market. It, it, it uh, beat out 2013, which I thought was an extremely hot seller's market. And I hope we never uh, would, would go through that again. And 2000. Uh, 21 ended up being hotter than 2013. We're dealing with a uh, record low inventory and that just meant a, a even hotter market. So from day one of 2013, January 1st, January 2nd, it was a hot, hot seller's market. It never slowed down. And that's typically not what we get. We kind of get a rev up as we get into January. By the time we get to the end of January, things are going and everybody says, hey, it's Super Bowl. This is the time uh, to come on the market, that type of thing. Uh, we rev up by the time we get to Super Bowl. But this year, it was hot from day one. It's kind of like a uh, prelude to what we can expect uh, this coming up year. 
bidding war. Of course, we're still dealing with lots and lots of bidding wars. And uh, so I wanted to talk about that earlier this year. And that's been the flavor of the entire year. Waiting will be costly. I've been saying it all year. You need to purchase. You need to get back into the center ring. It hasn't changed. My take has not changed even today. If you are in the market to purchase, waiting is not really a good idea. And it's just going to cost you more on a monthly basis if you do wait. Crash coming, we'll answer that. I answered that back in May. I'll answer that today. It hasn't changed. Is housing unaffordable? Less affordable, yes. But is it unaffordable? No, that's not necessarily what it's all about. Matter of fact, I did a recent report about this. Everybody hones in on that price, but they're missing a couple factors. It's not just about the median sales, sales price or prices where they're at. You got to take a look at other factors. Where are interest rates? That's a big, gigantic factor. And where are household incomes? So you look at all of the picture, the complete picture, besides where prices are at, and it kind of tells you where we are today, which there's still room for more, uh, for, uh, more of a rise in the inventory, I mean, in, the, uh, in prices. Uh, do I like to see these rises continue? I really don't, but uh, can, we, uh, can we continue to go and, and, and it not hurt the overall housing market? Yes, so, uh, but uh, so we'll, we'll talk more about that. Summer transition, there are seasons. I've talked about the different seasons. This was the summer season. People have to understand what happens as we transition from one season to the other. And uh, talked about permanently parked. People are not moving like they did before. If you t take a look at this, you'll see that, uh, that the turnover rates for LA, it's once every 28 years that people are moving. Orange County, once every 24 years. Uh, for Riverside County, it's once every 16, and then it's once every 20 years for San Bernardino and San Diego County. And I know that they talk about once every 11 years, that's California Association of Realtors, National Association of Realtors, but that has everything to do with the fact that they're doing surveys. If you're younger, you're gonna be surveyed more often because you're gonna move more often. But as you get older, you're gonna age in place. As a matter of fact, it's 93% of all seniors plan on aging in place. And uh, so they're not really moving. And they and when you age in place, which means you're not gonna move, you're not gonna get surveyed. So the, the surveys make it look like it's artificially lower than it really is. This has taken real uh, solid data, single family residents, detached and condos, combining the two, that's the total number of units available. And then how many closed through, not th just through the multiple listing service and agents, but how many went through the county recorder's office. That'll tell you two cl true closings. Well, then you get a true ratio from looking at that. And for 2020, it was, like I said, between uh, 16 years to 28 years, uh, once every 16 to once every 28 years. So uh, are we gonna have a, uh, a wave of foreclosures? Well, I said no earlier in this year, and I'll update you now. How about last call for 2021? That was prior to Thanksgiving. Uh, we do have these distinct different seasons, like I said, and when you need to place things into escrow, when you need to be looking for a property, when there will be fewer homes for you to look at if you're a buyer. Luxury soars, it's been soaring all year. We'll update that, that uh, based upon that. Housing insanity, it's been insane. What will it take to, to slow down? Uh, I talked about that earlier. I'll still, my, my opinions haven't changed. November housing heat wave. You could say that about December, even though it was hot in November, really outside and in the housing market. It's been cooler for de December. However, it is still hot. As a matter of fact, in many markets, it's even hotter than it was in November. And then inventory catastrophe. That's what we're dealing with, an inventory catastrophe. And we'll talk about that. Not about the price. This is the most recent uh, report that I had that came out. And once again, I don't want people to focus just on the price. You got to look at where payments are. How does your family, uh, how, how does that payment fit into your family's budget? And that's how people should be talking and looking at it. And uh, so I, I offered that up in the most recent one. But let's talk about this big, gigantic housing crash that we are supposed to have, that everybody is talking about. I want everybody to take a step back. This is me. This truly is how I feel inside. I am a quantitative economics and decision sciences major, and, and I'm a housing analyst. I wear those badges, uh, and, and I'm not ashamed of it at all. I like being a nerd. I like geeking out on all that there is to talk about or read on the, uh, on the economic scene, not just in housing, but across the board, everything that's going on. 
locally, as well as the state, as well as the U.S. and even globally. So I, I like to follow it all, and it's it's a lot of fun to uh, for me to look at the numbers all of the time. This is a cockpit. I don't expect you or anybody else to uh, climb into this cockpit and know how to, to fly it. I would never want to even pretend that I could. I mean, I think I know how you pull up on the yoke and it goes up and then that, that thing in the middle is for uh, like uh, to go faster. That's all I know. I don't know much anything else. So all those instrument uh, gauges, I wouldn't know I'd crash the plane. So I won't even pretend I can get behind the uh, seat there. This is how my cockpit looks at all these instrument gauges. I'm very familiar with all of this stuff and I put it all together to look for various trends and to look at a giant picture so that I can properly analyze where we are today, where are we going to go from here. And yet, unfortunately, even though I have this cockpit and it's daunting with all of the different things that I look at, but that's what I do. I have, I, I love it. I, this is my passion. However, so many people sit in my seat and pretend like they know what's going on with the, they know how to fly the plane. And, and it's just, they, they don't have the credentials to back it up. They wear a suit like myself and they sit uh, and they, and they uh, videotape these and go live on, on YouTube and get a lot of hits and have 100,000 people, a million uh, people take a look at uh, the, their latest crash video. And I've seen a lot of these crash videos and they drive me nuts because Actually, it makes my blood pressure go up a little bit. Just because they're wearing a suit or they look really nice doesn't mean that they know what they're talking about. Doesn't mean they're a housing analyst. Just because they made it rich or had it right one time as an investor or whatever the reason is, or they're selling some product, just understand that that doesn't make them the expert on housing. They're not a housing analyst. And, uh, so this is what gets my uh, blood boiling a little bit is these people. And as a result, there's a ton, a plethora of social media misinformation. I'm just asking people to please ignore all the social media misinformation. Check their credentials. Check their credentials. How can they be a housing analyst if all they've ever done is put money into the stock market? That has nothing to do with being a housing analyst and understanding uh, what the economic trends are. Social media misinformation. Home values have been absolutely skyrocketing. And you can see this, this is the Case-Shiller home, uh, home Composite Index. And here we are, oops, and here we are at 2013 and to, uh, 2012, 2013. We had uh, appreciation as high as 15%, almost 15%, and then it came down. What had happened was uh, we had a little bit of uh, rising rates in 2013. We had a taper tantrum and we had interest rates rise significantly that year and as a result we saw appreciation by the time we get down to 2014 we were at five percent appreciation it didn't become a buyer's market it just became less hot and that is more of what i've been rooting for for quite some time because this is 2020 to 2021 and it is a real issue so that's funny that him into is this is that a sign of the housing market crash? Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> 2020 to 2021, I was hoping we'd get higher rates, so we could turn this puppy around. And now it's kind of topped out at 20%. It's staying right around there. We'll see where it goes. I imagine it's going to go down to about 15%. Uh, some say it'll go down to about 10%. It's still hotter, twice as hot as where we were. Uh, during the uh, about 2014 all the way through 2018. 2019 was a slower year. But then um, uh, I'm, I'm actually hoping for higher rates so we can bring that down even further. So the real fear comes in from everybody is afraid of there being a, uh, another great recession. So we remember what that burn was like. We remember what that burn was like back in uh, back in uh, 2007, 2008, 2009, we know what that what that burn was like during the Great Recession. It either happened to us or happened to somebody else that we knew or loved, and we know what that that burn felt like. And and as a result, we don't want to be the person that buys at the top. There are so many uh, buyers that are afraid of buying at the top. This is what I've heard. I've asked agents if you heard anybody say that they're afraid of buying at the top, and almost every hand goes up. I'm here to tell you right now that we're not at a top and that the housing market, even if it were to top out, it's not going to fall like it did during the Great Recession. 
So what happened prior to the Great Recession, this big run up to the Great Recession, was what we refer to as a credit bubble. And this is the uh, purchase application index from uh, the Mortgage Bankers Association. You can see this was prior to the Great Recession. There was this big run up. And what happened was even two dogs got uh, mortgages. Everybody was getting mortgages. There were adjustable rate mortgages. You could fog a mirror, get a mortgage. Uh, there there uh, was, were so many strange products that were out there. You could put 0% down and get a loan. And also besides two dogs getting um, mortgages, we've had, we had a lot of dead people purchase houses and get mortgages. And they had their social security numbers that belonged to people that had passed away. And there you go. What and uh, it was just absolutely an awful time. That's what we, why I refer to it as a, a credit uh, bubble. And this is where we are today. And you can see it it's does, it's doesn't have an, the, the spike that we had back, back uh, prior to the Great Recession. This is just a slow methodical trend of an increase in purchase applications. And it's nothing out of bounds. As a matter of fact, it looks good to me. And uh, when we went into the pandemic, it dropped after we were starting to come out of our lockdowns, it spiked and then it came back down. And now it's been bouncing around trend and it's been following trend. Long term trends are boring and it's what we like to look at in economics land. And prior to the uh, Great Recession, the left hand side of this chart, there are a number of mixed bags of credit scores as far as people that were purchasing or refinancing. On the right-hand side, we have pretty much really stellar credit rules the day. Matter of fact, it's like survival of the fittest. We've had such a hot market that the people with the best credit, the most money in the bank with the largest down payments, the ones that are winning. And as a result, it's people with very, very strong credit that aren't going anywhere, that they have strong jobs, and we're in an expansion, expansionary period of job growth. So where is all of this negative tsunami of people that have to sell for this thing to, to crash? Where is it going to come from? It's not going to come from all of these people that have a really good loan, have a really good job, and are in no uh, hurry to get anywhere. Why would they all of a sudden all want to uh, sell their homes at the same time? Uh, that's just not going to happen. So prior to the Great Recession, we had what, uh, if you follow supply and demand, we had an issue. And I could see it coming like a big locomotive. And really what it was is a supply glut. So this is what happened in 2005. So the fall of 2005, we knew that there was a problem. We went from a three-month unsold inventory index. This is courtesy of California Association of Realtors. It's their data. So their unsold inventory went from three months all the way to six months at the end of, uh, of 2005. And then in 2006, it made its way all the way up to eight months. And then in, in 2007, we were just shy of 12 months. And then in 2008, we made it past 16 unsold inventory. When you have that much inventory and people are competing against each other as sellers, the only way to win is to drop your price substantially uh, less than your neighbors and the last comp so that uh, th that's the one that stands out. That's why we had the big fall in prices. Now, you compare that to where we are today, and we have a very, very low number of homes, what I refer to uh, not fondly as the housing uh, crisis, the inventory crisis. Uh, Great Recession, over 40% of all mortgages had less than 10% equity. 28% of all mortgages were fully underwater. And this comes out every Friday, so it'll come out again tomorrow. This is forbearances, the number of forbearances that are active right now. It's actually dropped uh, the prior week to last Friday, 1.9% to 1.7%. It was a giant drop and it went from about a little under a million to 882,000 people across the United States are currently in forbearance. 93% of these 882,000 people have at least 10% equity, which means that the vast majority of these people can sell their homes if push comes to shove and they're still in a pickle after they come out of forbearance. 4.3 million was the height of the number of people in forbearances at one time, and that was June of 2020. There were 7.7 .7 million forbearances total that have gone through the system. And, uh, so what happened to everybody that exited? 
at the beginning of the first Monday of the month, uh, Black Knight comes out with something and they kind of tell you what happened to these people that came out of forbearance. So the most recent one that came out was at the very beginning of the, the month of December this month, and they, they analyzed the prior month. So they're about a month behind, but this will give you a flavor of where things have been heading for a long time. So 6.7 million people have come out of forbearance and 4 million of them, 59% are performing on a monthly basis. What happened? They either never were behind on their payments or they paid it off in a lump sum or did a payment plan or they deferred it to the end of the uh, loan. And it's kind of a mixed bag as to which one. They didn't all defer it to the end like so many people have thought. And the number that paid paid off their, their mortgage, either they refinanced or sold their homes, is 28%, 1.9 million people. So if you do the math, that's 87% either are performing or paid it off. And this was 90%. It came down a little bit because this one has been growing the most. So how about they're delinquent, but working with the workout unit? This thing went from about 250,000 to 543,000 in the last few months because a lot of people are coming out of forbearance all at once. That is 8% of uh, everybody out there is uh, working with the workout unit of the 6.7 million. So 4% aren't working with the workout unit and they're delinquent. And another, it's almost less than 1%, 38,000 are currently in foreclosure. So if you do the math, that's 5%. 95% are, they are either working with the workout unit paid off or are performing. So the vast majority of everybody that's coming out of forbearance is doing just fine. And there's gonna be no wave of foreclosures. It's not like before where 28% of all mortgages were fully underwater. That's not what we're dealing with today. So no wave of foreclosures, it's not gonna happen. And we're not gonna, this is not a bubble. This is not a crash. Instead, this is a really strong, healthy housing stock. All the homeowners combined are healthy with mounds and mounds of equity, with good jobs, with high credit scores. It's really, really strong across. And so we're not gonna have that crash or bubble. Instead, it's what I don't like to call, but called it over and over again. It's just unhealthy. It's like Super Bowl eating every single day. It's just not what I would like to see is, is this unhealthy eating of, uh, on an ongoing basis. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's not going to be a crash. It's just uh, this thing has to slow down. Eventually, we'll get to price levels where finally people will be turned off by it. But I don't want to get to that. I want to get to the place where interest rates rise to slow this thing down and we slow down the amount of appreciation. So where are rates headed? That is the big question. This came out today, because uh, when you're a nerd, you know exactly when everything's coming out. So Freddie Mac's primary mortgage market survey comes out every single Thursday. This is with one point. And so it's uh, the reason for that is because back in the day, because the thing goes back 51 years, back in the day, it was, man, a long, long, uh, it was one, one point was required across the board. Everybody had to pay a point. Now you can get away with paying no points, but in order to compare apples to apples today to uh, 51 years ago, it, you have to look at paying one point. So your 3.12% is where things are at right now, paying that point. And 3.12% uh, is an incredible low rate. As a matter of fact, COVID-19, when it started in March 2020, prior to COVID, 3.12% would be an all-time record low interest rate. So, and I'll answer all these questions at the end, including Mark's, which is pretty fun. I love anybody that tries to predict a, a recession that far off and there's no recession flags up. But anyways, uh, COVID-19 uh, started in March, 2020, three point, uh, prior to COVID, 3.12% would be an all-time low. The lowest level that we ever had was 2.65% and that occurred in the first week of this year, first week of January. So yes, we have been lower. So 3.12% is higher, but it's still a record low if you compare it to anything prior to COVID-19. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about 10-year treasury. And you're probably wondering why do lenders and everybody talk about the 10-year treasury when they're talking about mortgages? The reason for that is because the appetite for the investor that's looking at 30-year mortgages is the same appetite for the investor that's looking at 10-year treasuries. They kind of 
jive with each other. When the 10 year rises, the uh, 30 year mortgage rises. When 10 year falls, 30 year mortgages fall. That There's the stickiness to it and we call that the spread and that's what we follow. And uh, by the way, incidentally, this short term rate that the Federal Reserve is talking about raising three times next year, that is short term interest rate, car loans, credit card debt. It is not, it, there's not a stickiness to it with long term uh, interest rates like what we're dealing with with 30 year mortgages. Just because they're going to raise it three times does not mean that we're going to get interest rates that go up as a result in uh, as far as 30 year mortgages are concerned. So please understand that. So, so far this year, the 10 year treasury rose from the start of the year until we got to March and we hit an interest rate height of 3.18% was the highest and it happened in March. And I was stoked because I wanted it to keep on going because we'd get a shift in the market. But instead, 10 year treasury dropped, so did 30 year mortgages. And in August, we bottomed out at 2.77%. So we're all the way up to 3.18, got to 2.77%. Then it went up again, I was excited, and then it went down. Then it went up and then it went down. And there's been this, there's been a lot of news about a couple of different things that have kind of made it stay within a channel of three to where it's at today, that through, you know, like three and an eighth. And that's where it's been staying. And that's Omicron news kind of brings it down a little bit. Inflation news kind of brings it up a little bit, but it's still staying within a channel, even though we have this, this high inflation. There is this volatility. And as, as the Federal Reserve moves more out of uh, mortgage-backed securities uh, and buying uh, treasuries, that we'll see a little bit more volatility in the market. So it'll kind of act on its own rather than the, uh, the Federal Reserve just playing at a certain rate that you can expect. Now it's up to the general public investor to make things happen. Now they did talk about tapering and it was big news yesterday. It was yesterday, right? I can't remember if all my days are beginning to blur, but they, yes, it was yesterday. So mortgage-backed security, new purchases. So what they've done is all the loans that are put together by the federal government, they're actually, that it's backed by them and they, they put, they're actually buying these securities uh, because they, 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 they turn around and sell them as a uh, package them off as securities. That's what these different agencies do. And, and the fed has been very involved in buying mortgage backed securities. As a matter of fact, in October, it was at 40 billion. Then in November, it started to come down. This is the tapering that they announced. It went down to 35 billion and December it's 30. Well, guess what's happening in January, February, March, they're going to strip off 10, 10, 10, 10, and it's going to get down to zero by the time we get to March. So when that, that happens, it looks like they're all done. They're not playing in mortgage-backed security land, right? That's not correct because there's something else that they're doing that they're not really talking about it. You'll see it mentioned here and there, but it doesn't get the same airplay. And that is mortgage-backed security reinvestments. What happens to all the money that they're collecting on a monthly basis, as well as anybody that sells their home or refinances their home and pays off their mortgage. Now they get these, these mortgage-backed securities, you know, they're paid off. So what do they do with them? They put it right back into the market. And it's at the tune of right around $60 billion per month. And they will continue to do this. All the reinvestment, they'll continue to do this going forward until they announced that they were gonna taper that. That's not what they've announced. They've only announced tapering of new purchases, the $40 billion they've been committed to, but they're continuing to do this reinvestment. So they're still playing hard and heavy in mortgage-backed securities, even though they're talking tapering. So what would make interest rates really go up? Well, good COVID news, good jobs reports, stimulus packages, infrastructure, money being poured into the system, juices things up, and also inflation tends to make it rise. And we've seen recently, yet it's been a big yawn fest as far as mortgage, as far as the investors are concerned. And that is inflation hit a 39 year high, highest since 1982, 6.8%. When you look at court, still really high. But part of this has to do with this disruption of COVID. As a matter of fact, we would not be dealing with this had it not been uh, with with uh, because of the disruption of COVID here and around the world, everybody's having this problem, the same problem. And that's be and it's affecting rental car companies and used cars and new vehicles. As a matter of fact, I just heard somebody that was looking to purchase a brand new car and they got to the car lot and it was like 30, it was $28,000 for the car. And they said, yeah, there's a $10,000 COVID premium that you have to pay and you'll get your car in two weeks. So. That is a big piece of this of this inflation puzzle. The gas pump is a big 
piece of our inflation puzzle because gas prices have risen with demand that all of a sudden came back to life and is soaring. So know that that's a big piece of it. As far as this transitory, Federal Reserve got rid of it because after a while, people were pointing their fingers going, they're calling this temporary and it's here to stay for a little while. And sure enough, that's exactly what's happening. So just know that the biggest disruptor, COVID, that's the biggest disruptor that I've ever seen in economics land has hit us. And that's uh, and and it's hit not only us, but everybody around the world. And it has disrupted quite a few things. The supply chain problem, it's not just trucks, it's not just ships, this is off of Long Beach. It's the whole entire system, inventories, uh, factories being shut down because of COVID, things like that have really exasperated the problem. And this is broken and needs to be fixed in many, many different uh, places. It's not just unloading the ships or getting trucks out there. There are, there's too many of the, of this, too many parts to the system that, uh, uh, that need to be ironed out. So it's going to take a while. Then we have this microchip. There's been an absolute run on microchips because we all went online and we all got new gear and we, uh, there was this big run on it and then factories were shut down. So they just, there's just not enough chips. And where does it affect the most? It affects them with new cars. New cars run on a very antiquated chip technology and these chip companies don't want to make their antiquated chips because they don't make enough money. They want to make, they want to make, uh, make chips that they make the most money on. That makes sense, right? So these different, uh, companies out there, these car companies are looking for places to build their own chips. And uh, we've heard Mexico and they're building plants down there and it's going to take 18 months for them to make it. So it's not going to be until like the end of 2022 where we might start to see more cars on these car lots. So it's really going to be a problem for quite some time. What am I most concerned about in economics land? It's probably jobs. And right now, unemployment levels are at 4.2 million, which is the same as November of 2017, we weren't really worrying about unemployment in 2017, were we? And instead, uh, it were, people are still talking quite a bit about unemployment. We really shouldn't be. We're going to be back to full employment, back to where we were prior to the pandemic by the uh, uh, end of summer of this coming up year. So we'll get back there. It's, it's, that's, a tra 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 that's the trajectory that we are on right now. And there's also been this great resignation and the great resignation is there's been several months. I know that uh, October it came down a little bit, but it's still extremely high for the last several months, including October. And uh, it's just a lot of people quitting on top of the people that are looking for a job that are unemployed. However, there are over 11 million people, I mean, 11 million job openings. There are more job openings than there are people. Wrap your head around this. This has happened two months in a row for September and October. There are 0.7, that's less than one person that's looking for a job per job opening. So there's 0.7 people available for every job opening. So when we got into the pand pandemic, it was five people looking for a job for every job opening. Now it's less than one person that's available for every job opening. So there's not enough people available for the number of jobs that are there. And you're seeing this with uh, McDonald's. I, there was the sign that made it, it made uh, the press across the United States where they, they're paying 20 bucks an hour uh, at McDonald's, which is over $40,000 per year full time. So uh, that's putting a lot of pressure on Big Macs and pricing all across the board. And as a result, with the job side, side of things, I'm starting to get a little bit concerned about the inf inflationary pressures from that. And that's what I'm watching more than anything else. And just know that when this inflation thing, when a lot of this subsides, there will still be a stickiness. If your if you're a rack of lamb at Costco from New Zealand went from uh, $19 to $30, don't expect that rack of lamb to come back down to $19. It's gonna stick right around 30 bucks. So uh, best, one of the best hedges against inflation because it's a forced savings because you're gonna be paying uh, somebody's mortgage if it's not your mortgage and you're renting. The best hedge against inflation is real estate because you're fixing your asset, how much you're paying on a monthly basis. And as rents go up, which they are, you're fixed. So, and over time, it looks smarter and smarter and smarter as rates continue to go up, uh, uh, rents continue to go up. So interest rates are gonna float between 2.75 to 3.5% next year. Yes, we can get back into the twos. The lower we get, the more insane the housing market's gonna be. 3.5%, uh, it's gonna be hard to get above that 3.5%. Uh, that's with one point uh, down because that's what I, I'm doing all my stuff on. And uh, that 
will be very, very difficult to get to because we have to see the 10 year go above two, which it's having a really hard time even making its way towards two. So uh, I think that we're in for and know that the higher the interest rate, the more if it's not an insane seller's market. It's just a seller's market, not a buyer's market, just a seller's market. And oh, I, I saw this. Yeah, th and th this is pr pretty fantastic. This is uh, Len Kiefer. Uh, he's uh, very active on, on Twitter. And forecasting is extremely hard to do. Look at this. So the forecast always uh, at the end of uh, every year is always for interest rates to go up almost. And you can see what they actually do is the black line. So we're always predicting for interest rates to go up, yet they typically trend down. And you can see that best in this chart. I thought this was a brilliant chart. So just because everybody's forecasting interest rates to go up out there doesn't mean that interest rates are going to go up. Chances are based upon this, that they're actually going to go down lower. So uh, the housing market, where are we? It is insane. Absolutely insane. It's a supply and demand issue again, but it's not a supply glut like we were dealing with prior to the Great Recession. It's Instead, I don't even like to say supply crisis. I like to call it a supply catastrophe, like the uh, house report I wrote a couple back, because that is exactly what this is. It is a catastrophe. And we'll get into the numbers, but I also want everybody to know that they think that all of a sudden that there's an economic cycle in, in economics land, it, that happens once every 10 years that the market corrects. That's just not true. I have been doing this since the 80s and I cannot find this cycle that people are talking about. There is no 10 year cycle that this happens, that, that the real estate market turns. It, it doesn't happen. So if you have a client that says, yeah, every 10 years that the market turns, have them contact me. I, I'm more than happy to be educated by anybody, clients, anybody. They can tell me where it is in the data and what they're following so that I can be educated on that. So, because I haven't seen it and I've been looking at it for it since the 80s. And the there is a cycle to the market. The cycle is seasonality. It's every year we deal with it, except for the COVID year because we had a late spring and never really had that much of a holiday market. Spring is the best. It is the best time of the year. It is the number one month for homes coming on the market, the month of May. And that's true for every county in Southern California. And it is the typically the best month of the year for demand, May, and that's because it's spring. That's when households with kids would like to place their home on the market, go into escrow, that type of thing, because they can go ahead and close during the summer when the kids are out of school. That's why May is the hottest season. People do it all year long, but May is number one. And then summer, there are fewer homes that come on the market, especially the later you get because you're getting too close to school. But it does come down a little bit, but it's still really strong. Autumn is when the kids go back to school, things downshift even more, both on the buyer side of the side of things and listing side of things. And then we have a fifth market because we have winter, but we also have the holidays and that's what we are in, it, in now. Then we get to the winter market. That is where always we hit right around Super Bowl and a whole bunch of real estate agents say, this is the best time to come on the market. Please come on the market right now. This is a really good time. Come on the market. It's February right after Super Bowl. It couldn't be hotter. They are correct. It's typically a really, really hot point in the marketplace, but they don't want to come on the market yet. Why not? Because they want to wait till what month? May, spring. That's what they're waiting for, spring. So uh, right now in the holiday market, that's when the fewest number of homes come on the market, the month of December. The second fewest, the month of November. Either the third or fourth, depending upon your market, is the month of January. So we're in this patch of very few homes coming on the market. And uh, as a result, the inventory is really plunging. Even if people want to buy houses, there's no houses for them to buy. And basically, we're running on empty as far as the inventory is concerned. So inventory and demand are both plunging right now. And some buyers are going, forget it. I'll wait till after the new year. Uh, uh, sign me up for the holidays. Bring me some eggnog, please. So the Southern California supply looks like this. Inventories have just been plunging, just like I said that they would be. And we're plunging down to new territories, new lows. And on December 9th, so basically uh, last last Thursday, we uh, that's when we crunched the numbers. And that's what this chart shows every two weeks. 
We were uh, at 14,580. We dropped 7% in a two week period. The prior two week period, we dropped, dropped the most of the year, but this one wasn't as big. It's down 7% or down 1,072 homes. But this is the lowest level since tracking. And every single time I crunch this for the rest of the year, it is even lower. So we're getting lower and lower and lower until we ring in a new year. Last year, we were at 21,368 at this time. That's 47% higher than where we are today. And you see how low the green line is compared to prior years? Well, that is because last year was the, was the lowest level for this time of the year that I've seen since tracking. This year, it's less. What were we complaining about last year? Not enough homes. And that is exactly what we're complaining about this year. The three-year average is 35,962. That is 147% higher than today. And I'm going to compare it to the three-year average. The three-year average is 2017, 18, and 19 prior to COVID. These were the normal markets and we should have had about 36,000 homes in the market right now. That's where we should be. And instead we have 14,580. So we're like two and a half times higher than where we are today is where we should be. So the peak occurred on August 19th, 20,643. That we've gone down 30% since that peak. And that's a normal peak for the inventory is right during the summer between July and August. And today, today I actually snapped it this morning, we're at 13,607. So it's gone down another 10% just since last Thursday. So this is really where it's plunging down to the depths of its lowest point of the year. So where are we gonna end up at the end of the year? That will be part of the forecast momentarily. I want you to know that LA is at 5,708. It dropped 8% in the last week and it is already at a new record. It was last week. Uh, Orange County is has been at a record low level since October and it just dropped another 8% in the last week. We're at 1,256 homes in Orange County, new record. Riverside's at 2,632, dropped 4% in the last week. It's not yet at record uh, territory. Riverside does something completely different and their lows typically occur in the, at the uh, middle to end of February. So that's what I'm expecting. They'll hit a new low in, in February. San Bernardino is at 2378, also dropping right now, down 4%, but not at a new record. I don't think San Bernardino is gonna match their record low for this year. It's one of the only counties that won't beat this year's low. Uh, and which is good news for people in San Bernardino County, still 2378 is well below the three-year average prior to COVID. San Diego is at 1,633, went down 10% in the last week, and it too is at a new record. And San Diego is the worst of the bunch as far as the least number of homes on the market for San Diego County, 1,633 for their giant uh, county. And Orange County is, is much smaller than San Diego County, and they're at 1,256, they're the second worst off. And where are all the homes? Well, so far in Southern California, if you compare it to 2017 to 2019, the number of homes placed on the market missing nearly 50,000 homes. And it will hit 50,000 at the end of December. So we will have 50,000 homes that are missing from the market for the years of 2020 and 2021. And that's 9% of the market. That's just a big chunk of the market that never came on the market. And who knows what happens to them? People said that it's pent up seller. I just don't see it. I just don't see it happening. I see us following normal trajectory and there's like this new norm and that is fewer homes coming on the market. Uh, and that's where it's going. It's not because of COVID-19. So many people thought it was because of COVID-19, but I don't think that's the narrative. People were asking this through surveys, but I don't think that that's the narrative that I wanted to, uh, that I really think that that's keeping homeowners from placing their homes in the market. What is it? It's where will I go? I know there's nothing on the market right now. So why do I want to place my home on the market and go look for nothing? And there are different strategies around finding something. And uh, so agents can help out with those strategies, but many, many homeowners are just not convinced. Instead, they just want to sit back. Yes, I'm just going to sit back. Oh <laughs> yeah, this is great. I'm fine. I'm a fat cat. My values are absolutely going up. They're checking Zillow every single month, pun intended for all those in real estate land with checking their estimate. But anyways, they're checking their value on a monthly basis and they've been watching it soar. And it's true that values have absolutely been soaring. And it, they're, so they're more than happy just to stick around and stay while their home values continue to go up. Southern California demand, that is the last 30 days of escrow activity. 
So I look at that escrow activity, escrow activity. What does demand look like? And it has been nutty. And the fuel are these low interest rates. And I don't know if you've been following this, but about, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, FHFA uh, announced government is going to, for government backed mortgages, is going to rise to high cost areas all the way up to 970,800. So they're almost doing a million dollar loans. Uh, the baseline is 647.2. That is where San Bernardino and Riverside are. 647,200 is the new government backed loan. So jumbo doesn't start until above 64.72. And for San Diego County, it's at 879,750. So they have lines, they have a, a, a higher loan limits at 879.750. And LA and Orange County are at 970,800. This allows people to put 5% down and still qualify, get money from people. And it's a little bit easier to qualify for than Jumbo. Does it, and they'll take a little bit less, uh, a little bit more riskier credit scores. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're gonna take uh, people that uh, have really awful credit scores or anything like that, but it does make it easier to get a loan for conventional versus jumbo. So it allows there to be more demand at the beginning of 2022. As a matter of fact, a lot of lenders are already lending to these loan limits. So you know what? They're all, it's already adding to the demand side of the equation. As a result of so much demand and very little inventory, everything is selling for over asking. Not everything, but most everything. It's like an auction out there where the, rever re the reserve price is the asking price. And I don't have the updated thing yet because California Associated Realtors hasn't done this. They're about to announce this any day. I, I imagine they're gonna announce it today or tomorrow, the latest on Monday, and that's gonna be the November closed sales. But this is through October. It's at the number of sales above the list price is 60.2%, which means that in the month of October, all closed sales for the state of California, every price range, 60.2% sold above the asking price. It was at 70% or above for the months of May, June, and July. And now it's coming down. People are saying, yeah, it's coming down because the market's starting to cool. No, that's not it. Because if you look at all of these other years, you can see over here that that, that it goes up and then comes down, then it goes up and then comes down. It's called a seasonality factor. And that's what we're dealing with is just a seasonality. And as a matter of fact, I know that we're dealing with such multiple offers right now that we might in the month of D January, which is not typically, we see it in February where we start to see the sales above list price start to rise. And then it keeps on ratcheting up through the spring months. And we're gonna see it earlier this coming up year because of how low inventory is going. And we might surpass 70%. Uh, above asking price and know that the highest prior to COVID uh, sales above the list price was 40% for the state of California. And now we're dealing with seventies and sixties. Wow. Amazing. The median days on market hat is 11 days for the month of October. And for the month of October sales to list price ratio for across California is 101.5% average house selling for one and a half percent above their list price. It was at 102.3, like a couple months prior, but man, that's still really juiced up high. So demand, that's the last 30 days worth of escrow activity for December 9th was at 15,328, dropped 9% in the last two weeks uh, prior to December 9th. So that two week period dropped 9%, 1,422 pending sales. That was the largest drop of the year for demand. So the inventory actually drops the largest the two weeks prior demand for the last two weeks. And then last year at this time, 17,079. So yes, there was more demand, more escrow activity, but that was because of a delay in the spring market. If you see that green line last year, it dropped like a rock when we initially had the lockdown. So uh, demand picked up later because of a, a lag in the spring market. The three-year average was 11,975. So 2017 to 2019, we were looking at 22% less than where we are today. So even though we have fewer homes coming on the market and inventories that are depleted, everything that's coming on is pretty much being shoved right into escrow. That's how fast this market is. And we are still placing more in escrow than we did prior to COVID. The peak occurred on May 28th at nearly 20,000 and we've gone down 23% since. So today, today, crunching it this morning, 14,480 dropped 6% uh, since. So how fast is this market moving? Well, uh, on December 9th, it was at 29 days. That's up one day in a two week period of time, one day. And it's the lowest reading uh, was on April 1st at 23 days. 
these are just ridiculous numbers. And we'll get into more ridiculous numbers in a second. Last year was at 38 days this time. And we thought that last year was an extremely hot market. This year is even hotter. And the three-year average is 92 days, which is just above a seller's market and for the end of the year. You can see how it typically spikes at the end of the year. So 92 days is not, you know, it's kind of a balanced market. It's not a buyer's or seller's market. And that's where we should be, enjoying our holidays. That's typically what happens today today. So I crunched today's supply and today's demand, the inventory and today's recent escrow activity. Now it's at 28 days. It actually got hotter in the last week. And here we are in this, you know, throes of middle of December, right? So uh, if you look at this, this is a speedometer. I know the numbers are backwards, but that's for so that you understand that the higher the number, the, the slower the market. You can see prior to the Great Recession, we were going about three miles per hour. We had over like a 220 day expected market time. And that mean, meant that things uh, took forever to sell. And the only way to sell your home was to reduce the price by like $20,000 below the most recent comp. That's called a deep buyer's market. Then it goes to a balanced market there in the middle. Then it goes slight sellers. Then it goes to hot sellers market, anything below 60. We're so far below 60, it is ridiculous. And it means that there's a lot of heat in the market. And you can see this, this between 60 and 90 is a slight sellers market. That was the year 2019. That was the purple line. That is where we don't get a lot of appreciation, but sellers get to call more of the shots. You have to be careful on pricing because you could be stuck. Below 60 is a hot sellers market. And then I'm going to zoom in because there's a new thing that I had to come up with this year, and it's called the below 40. It's called insane. That's the insanity level. That's where you want to say, uh-oh, eject, I'm out of here. This, is, this market's ridiculous. That's below 40. And in some markets, it's going well below 40. And where are we going to go for the rest of the year? We're going to stay here. And then next year, we're going to start to drop until we get to about uh, middle of February to the middle of March will be the, the hottest point in the market and it will be hotter than where we are today, which is ridiculous. Los Angeles is at a 34 day expected market time. Their lowest of the year was 32 days. Orange County is at 21 day expected market time. Their lowest was 20 days. That was about three weeks ago. They actually hit the low all the way here at, uh, during the holidays, which makes no sense. Riverside's at 25 days. Its lowest was earlier in the spring at 16 days. I've never seen anything that low. And then San Bernardino is knocking on the door of that, but they're at 33 days and they were a low of 18 days. So things have slowed down a little bit. Still extremely hot, just not the ridiculous pace at 18 days. Uh, I don't know what to call below 20 which San Diego is at 20 days. Their lowest ever was 19 days and they're right there. And that happened a while back and they're about to knock on the door of the hottest seller's market of all time for San Diego. Home values are rising. I can see it in the data. I don't care what anybody's saying out there, the narratives that are being written in, in, uh, in the media channels all over the place. I don't care what the median sales price is doing. Median sales price is not really what's happening with prices. I know with the boots in the streets that we're dealing with, tons and tons of offers and home values continuing to escalate because there's nothing on the market and lots and lots of offers that multiple offer situations. I do not see an end to this. I can't wait to talk about an end to this. I can't wait to talk about a crack in the market. I talked about in 2018 that there's a crack in the market and it's exactly what happened. I could see it in May that it was going to be slow at the end of the year and that's exactly what happened. We hit gigantic cracks. And, and we slowed down our, our market like crazy and we had a late inventory and demand fell, inventory peaked around uh, Thanksgiving. That's not a normal market and I could see it happening and occurring all the way as early as May. So when will the market slow? And then we'll, we're getting close to actually forecasting interest rates. It's when they rise. And it happened in 2013 and it happened in 2018. This doesn't, I pulled off zero. I'm starting here at 20,000 homes on the market. And I started off at 3% for interest rates, just so you can see the magnitude of the changes. And we had a 25, we went from a three and a quarter percent uh, interest rate all the way up to a four and a half percent interest rate in 2013. When you go that much up in interest rate, it slowed down demand and the inventory rose and so did the market time. And that's exactly what happened because we had the, uh, the inventory go from 25,000 homes to nearly 40,000 homes and it did not peak until around Thanksgiving, which is a late peak. And in 2018, we went from 4% to 5% and we went from less than 30,000 homes in the market. I think it was like 27,000 all the way up to 
be about 47,000 homes on the market. So things really did slow down quite a bit. So that's what I'm rooting for, higher interest rates so that we slow down demand and inventory rises. And then we have the market slow a bit. That's what I'm rooting for. Unfortunately, I don't know if we're gonna get there. Affordability, it's things aren't unaffordable. They're just less affordable. There's a mortgage rate sensitivity. I like to talk about this more than anything else because this is where interest rates were in 1990 at 10%. We can't stomach that. We can't stomach 8% interest rates. That was the year 2000. 6.35% was prior to the Great Recession and uh, can't stomach that interest rate. 5% was where we hit in 2018. We learned that 5% was too slow. We were only there for a minute, but if we would have stayed there for long term, it really would have slowed down our housing market. 4% is where I thought that the height was for if we got to a 4% interest rate or above that it would slow down our market during this year. And that was hoping that uh, interest rates were gonna rise. So that's where I had, had it 4%. But due to the fact that the, it, we're continuing to, to go at warp speed right now, I feel that it's at 3.75%. I think we're going to get enough juice and enough appreciation next year. It could surprise a lot of people and we end up at three and a half percent would be the height for if we got to three and a half percent that it would slow down our market above three and a half percent would slow down our market. That's where we could go. It's just this mortgage rate sensitivity because values are continuing to soar with interest rates remaining the same. And if they continue to soar, these changes of interest rates as they go up will slow down our market. And uh, so that's just because buyers do the math and they go, holy smokes, I don't want to do this. And enough people back out for this thing to slow down. So uh, market overview, and then we will go ahead and uh, forecast. But I'm here to tell you that if you look at this, that uh, there is a really strong demographic patch. They've been buying for a long time, it's millennials. I know that they weren't supposed to buy, but that was the narrative that everybody uh, chose to adopt, that there's strapped with college debt. Yep, they've been buying and they saved a lot of money. Talk to a lender, they have great portfolios and and uh, great balance sheets, all that good stuff. And just know that we have a very, very strong uh, demographic patch of first time home buyers, 32 year olds. And it started last year, it'll continue for the next several years. This year was bigger than last year. Next year will be bigger than this year. So we just have a really strong demographic patch that's adding and pushing more demand. Not all homes are selling instantly in SoCal. I want everybody to know that 52% of everything that's on the market right now has been on the market for more than 30 days. Part of that problem is if they went into escrow and they fell out, they no longer have that, that ribbon that says uh, new listing. And when it doesn't have that ribbon, buyers, it might say back on the market, buyers aren't as excited about back on the market as they are new listing. So it doesn't get as much play when it falls out of escrow. So if you're a buyer, look for stuff that's been on the market for a little bit of time that fell out of escrow. Those are probably some good bets that are out there. Once you start getting above two months on the market, then you start getting luxury because it's all price ranges when you're 30 days and above, but at 60 days plus, it's 32% of the market, it's more luxurious and definitely. There's only 2,970 homes across Southern California, 20% that have been on the market for more than three months, and this is ultra luxury. And Southern California closed sales is up down 3% over last year at this time. Don't be concerned about it being negative compared to last year because last year they had prints like this. This was the month of May. That was really low compared to what we did this year, the red line. So uh, overall, and I want you to know, out of the 17,291 closed sales, <laughs> 21 were short sales and 38 were foreclosures. That's it. Across Southern California, out of the 17,291, it is what? 59 homes that were either a short sale or foreclosure. Very, very little. So many people were saying there would be a wave of foreclosures by the time we got to the end of this year. It didn't materialize. I don't care when forbearance ends. It's just not going to materialize. So far this year through November, we're up 17% over last year. Know that this is the most sale in years. And uh, luxury has been surging. This is this big Himalaya on the right-hand side. And you can see the green bars. That was last year. That was a record year last year. This year, it's even a higher, a higher uh, number of closed sales. And you could see that uh, we're up 45% over last year for luxury. And January to November, it's up 87% over last year for the whole year so far through November. And that is an absolute record year. Uh, top 10% of any market is what we refer to as luxury. For uh, LA and Orange County, it's 1.5 million. That'll change January 1st of 2022. It's gonna be 2 million plus. 
uh, for San Diego County, it's 1.25 million. That will change January 1st of 2022. That is going to be uh, 1,500,000 plus. And San Bernardino County is going from 650 to 800. Uh, I, I kind of pushed up Riverside early, earlier than I expected because they, I knew that they were going to make it really fast. They're going to remain at 800,000 plus. It's just a little bit higher than 800. I think it's at 825, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to round it near 100,000. So, uh, but know that that the market has ingested, digested so many luxury listings that it's actually brought up the the uh, the term where luxury starts. It's very very high in almost all markets. So here we go. High cost of renting, rents are soaring. Know that there was a lag to when it began compared to uh, to the uh, residential resale and know that this will continue to go at a very, very fast clip. Their uh, rents are just absolutely skyrocketing right now. So the 2021 forecast looks like this. Don't quite know what's around the corner. Man, I think it was last week or a couple weeks ago where John Wayne Airport and Long Beach Airport were actually shut down because of fog. You want to slow yourself down. I was behind a big rig during all those rains a couple days ago. And let me tell you, I had to slow down because it was like whiteout. So yeah, I'm going to slow down a little bit and my because my 2022 concerns are uncertainty. I am not certain about the housing market. I mean, about uh, things that uh, are coming around the corner. I'm certain pretty much about where the housing market's gonna go, but I don't, I didn't see COVID coming. So it ultimately changed what happened in housing and actually made things worse. So you just don't know completely what's lurking around the corner. There is uncertainty. COVID-19 variants, for a lot of people they thought Delta was done, but now we have Omicron. I didn't even know what Omicron was. So uh, it's another another one of those obscure Greek letters that of, of the alphabet that I didn't know existed. So we all got to learn what and what Omicron was, so or is. And uh, as long as COVID is in the system, it's going to be a problem. It's going to keep a lid on interest rates as well. Rates remain low. That's a concern of mine. Washington D.C. is always a concern of mine, regardless of the administration. Wages rise too fast. A concern on the inflation side of things. Buyer fatigue. I want to push them into the center ring as long as I, I think it's a good idea. So I will continue to write reports around that. Values rise too fast. Of course, I'm concerned about that. Unrealistic sellers. So when this thing does finally slow down, you're going to have your hands full dealing with. Uh, uh, unrealistic sellers that that uh, wonder after two weeks, why hasn't my home sold? That's called the market has shifted. Get on the program here. So my 2022 forecast is distress rises slightly, no wave. In many markets, there are only like 10 on the market for any county, short sales and foreclosures. If it goes from 10 to 100, that'll be very similar to where we were prior to the pandemic for all of the county. Now, Going from 10 to 100 is tenfold, and you'll hear this, boy, it went up like a thousand percent. It doesn't mean that it's negative. Sometimes economics can lie, and in that case it does, because if you look at where we were prior to the pandemic, it's still gonna be really uh, good levels. So understand that distress will rise a little bit, but no wave compared to where we were in prior to the pandemic. Normal housing seasons. It'll follow a normal pattern next year. First half will be hot due to very limited inventory. And then as rates rise, second half will slow down a bit. And then record low inventory to start the year under 12,100. We're going to hit three record lows in LA, Orange County, and San Diego for January 1st. Uh, Riverside County is going to hit their low, I believe, in March. And uh, San Bernardino will get close to their record low, but they won't quite hit it. So uh, just not enough homes in the market, period. Rise in inventory eclipsing 30,000 homes, that's with higher rates. That's the only way that this is gonna happen and this isn't enough. This is getting towards average, but it's not gonna get there, but we need this initial step with higher rates and a higher inventory. Uh, demand, that's recent pending sales, will be down slightly year over year. The closed sales will be down three to six percent, which means 2021 was a stellar year. 2020 was a good year. It'll be between 2020 and 2021. And then luxury continue to soar, but slightly muted compared to 2021. So luxury continues to soar, but slightly muted compared to 2021. As the year progresses, there'll be a little bit more volatility in the system and volatility is not the best for luxury. So increase in move up sellers, that's 
because there's more products, so homeowners can finally come on the market and move up. So uh, buyers motivated by low rates, but not as willing to stretch as interest rates rise and values continue to rise. And appreciation in 2022 up 8 to 10%. This exceeds what CAR and NAR is talking about. I am just talking about Southern California, but that has a lot to do with inventories. Inventories are a lot lower than many, many people thought that they would get. Uh, I, I, after looking at the trend lines, I was going, uh oh, we are in trouble. And sure enough, we have very, very few homes in the market. And it's going to lead to very rapid appreciation for the first several months of 2022. Interest rates between 2.75 to 3.5%. We can get lower to 2.75% if something happens negatively in the system. We can get there. 3.5% will be pushing it. And I think it's going to fall somewhere in between, which is like what we've done. If you want a copy of this thing, I will send you a copy, but you have to be a subscriber. Just ask for a copy. I'll be more than happy to send you the PowerPoint presentation of this. If you aren't a subscriber, go to reportsonhousing.com, click on subscribe, and it's $15 per month or $150 per year. You get a month free if you sign up utilizing the coupon code 2022-2022. And I'd like to thank Kevin Buddy from Monarchos Financial. My buddy, your buddy, does deals with all kinds of loans. He's been doing this since 1976. Loads of experience. He took care of my family as well. You can contact Kevin Buddy, my buddy, your buddy, Kevin Buddy, at 949-422-2075. Thanks again for your continued support, Kevin. And that's all I have. I will answer some questions now that I saw in the uh, chat. I want to but I do want to take a moment and thank my wife for dealing with me when I'm like going crazy, when I have an internet issue or something like that, and just being here for me and being my support system and all my rock star kids that usually come in here and and make a, a brief uh, presentation or a brief moment where they come in here. They will continue to do that with the housing debrief coming up uh, this coming up year. So, uh, but now let's get into some questions that some people had because I saw that they had them. Uh, let's see. It starts with, oh yes, Mark Paulson asked. So did you see Chapman's prediction of recession in 2023? What's your opinion? Well, first off, they predicted a recession earlier. If you were following them in June, they talked about interest rates being at 4.75%. And then they dialed back that and the, their prediction just a few days ago was it to be 3.9%. I don't think we're going to get to 3.9%. Maybe with uh, a point we can get to three and three quarters percent, but we're not going to get all the way to three point nine percent. That's not going to be enough to derail everything and turn it into uh, a uh, you know uh, where we crash or anything like that, or it's a bubble. I think that's what they referred to it as in uh, earlier this year in June, and they called it a bubble. So I don't subscribe to that. I, I don't agree with that. I agree with many things that they bring up, but unfortunately, they've been a little bit off on on uh, their uh, interest rate calls which is why I follow somebody by the name of Logan Motashami. He's a good friend of mine, M-O-H-T-A-S-H-A-M-I, Logan Motashami, also a great housing analyst. He talks about perma bears and the uh, forbearance bros, and he has a whole bunch of terms. He's always coming up with, with uh, different terms. He's a genius that's, that, that's out there, but uh, yeah, he's somebody else to follow out there. Uh, but follow him on interest rates. He's He's been a lot more accurate than anybody else that I've seen out there. Uh, well, that inflation is also a result of administration policy. I'm not going to get into that. And uh, I told you I like to pull out uh, economics I I as far as policies are concerned. That's not where the inflation is coming from right now because they're having we're having inflation problems around the uh, world. We knew that COVID-19 was going to be a disruptor. It's just how long, uh, it, what was it going to take to to get out of this thing? Uh, David Baum, any, let's see, any thoughts about new reports showing increased California excess and fewer coming? I got my theories. How about you? All right, David, I usually get this in every presentation and UCLA did a fantastic study, a very, very thorough study back in July of this year. What they found is that there is this trend of exits. And the trend has been slightly increasing over time. COVID was not a disruptor in this trend. It didn't all of a sudden go up. It's just been a straight trend. And as far as the entrances are concerned, it's a few, a few fewer each year. The net net on it is right now we're at zero. And it's stated that we're going to be at zero for the next three years. Um, really what the problem is, so yeah, there are various reasons why people are slowly but surely leaving California. One of them has to do high costs. A lot of people have their various other reasons, political and, and otherwise, but a lot of people boomerang back as well. So uh, just just know that that, that, that that can occur. I've been hearing that everybody's been exiting uh, California since I've been in this in, when did I start? Uh, in 
1991. <laughs> Since then, everybody's moving to Austin. So Austin must be uh, just like California. I heard they have humidity, big bugs, and uh, big raindrops the size of cars. So it's not quite Southern California. But I do, uh, here's my theory on this. My theory on this is when everybody leaves, the impression is when they're leaving, they're, we're connected to them on social media. And when they go to wherever it is, Tennessee, to Texas, to South Carolina, to Florida, to uh, Idaho, to Montana, we've heard it. And they all said, we're over here. We're so excited. We had our first snowfall. So beautiful. And we're going, man, that sounds kind of cool, man. They, they went off. Look at all these people that are leaving. The problem is you're not friends with the people that are coming. A good example of this was somebody that was in my audience last night. She came from Kentucky, and this is exactly what happened. She was from the Bay Area. They moved to Kentucky, started a family and all that stuff, and finally got to get back to California, and they're now here in Orange County. And when they got, when they got here, they're all, hey, bye, everybody. We love you. It's going to be great. We're back home in California. We weren't friends with them. We didn't get to see that yet. So... Everybody back there, the impression is, boy, there's a lot of people moving to California. See, the issue is that we have this social media misinformation. We're not connected to the people who are coming. We're only connected to the people leaving. So the misinformation is everybody's leaving. You don't get that everybody's coming. So that's my theory on that, David. Uh, what is the un percentage of unemployed 15 and older? I don't have the exact numbers. So uh, I, I do, do not have, Deborah asked if what are the exact numbers above of unemployed above 50. They are out there. Go to Twitter. You can find a lot of unemployment data on Twitter. That's where all the geeks like to hang out is on Twitter. And so you'll find out a lot of good information. Uh, let's see. How about this one? Brent, if we have a listing coming down, we put on now or wait for Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> it just depends upon what you're doing. If you are moving up in value, put your home on the market immediately, right now, right now, and go buy something. Lock in these low interest rates, watch uh, your, your value soar because 10% of, let's just put it in simple numbers. Like let's say you're going from 500,000 to a million. If values go up 10% for 500,000, that's $50,000. If values go up 10% for a million dollars, that's a what? hundred thousand dollars. So if you're moving up, you're losing out on opportunity uh, to uh, gain even more in equity. So the sooner you do it, the better. So that's that's what I say. And it, quite frankly, people say, yeah, you should come on the market in the Super Bowl. Well, it depends upon what you want to do. If you want to downsize or you have a lateral move, you can wait. It doesn't really matter. You can wait till there's more properties for you wherever you're going. Or if you're downsizing, it's going to go up another 10%. You might as well like get the rewards of that and place your home on the market in what month? May. <laughs> like everybody else does, right? So we'll get to hide Brent and go to Lisa. Oh, and let's see if that would even put a dent in that number. Yeah, this is nuts. If persons that are in forbearance in California let their home go into foreclosures, everybody that was in, currently in forbearance lets their house go to foreclosure. It won't even put a dent in our problem. That's what Lisa said, and that's absolutely true. Uh, Charlie said active residential listings in Huntington Beach is at 94 homes total. I know it's really, really low. Like here in Ladera Ranch, we're at 19. We're typically at 100. As of yesterday, Elisa Viejo had a total of seven active listings. As a matter of fact, Elisa Viejo in Orange County has a seven-day expected market time. I've never seen an expected market time below 10. I've never seen an expected market time below 20. Here we are. Uh, let's see. Foreclosure rate is only 0.7% of the total market sales. Not much of an effect. Yep, that's right, M Mickey. Uh, iBuyers. Know that iBuyers are going to have such an infinitesimal effect on, on our marketplace. They are a disruptor, but they're so small, don't worry about them. So don't even worry about that. How much luxury track is there? Okay, here we go. How much that luxury track has resulted of the average price climbing to near over a million? Yeah. A lot, which is why I've had to move the, the gauge, although it's moved like crazy. There's been a lot of luxury sales and the needle's been moved up. So now I'm having a new, new level and I'm hoping we don't do a whole bunch more where I've got to move it up even higher than $2 million. Uh, I did an analysis for Santa Barbara. They're moving from 3.75 million to 4.5 million for their top 10% of their market. So I don't want to get to those kind of numbers. That's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, let's see. Uh, copy, please. Copy, please. Anybody else have a question? It doesn't really look like I have much of a question. That's a great. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin's on here. Thank you, Kevin, for once again, your continued support. 
Do you have uh, numbers on reverse migration? I don't have the exact numbers because I couldn't get it from UCLA, but you can look up the UCLA uh, uh, study that was done in July, the exits and all that. So just know that that will uh, that you can look it up and report it yourself. Uh, matter of fact, I even have a copy of it. Uh, I'll be more than happy to send it your direction. You can send me an email at Stephen, S-T-E-V-N, at reportsonhousing.com, and I'll send it to you. Um, spell that. Oh, would you please spell that name again, please? I think that she's referring to Mogan Shot Motishami. That's M Mogan. Logan, L-O-G-A-N, Motishami, M-O-H-T-A-S-H-A-M-I. He's fantastic. He does a super duper job. And let's see, uh, any, is there a chance you can do reports for the Coachella Valley and separate it from Riverside County? Ha, that's funny you should ask that, Scott, because I have it within there. I actually have Coachella Valley, all the charts with, embedded within the charts. As a matter of fact, you can see it. And I have the active listing inventory, the demand, the uh, a Coachella little tiny uh, report, and I have the expected market time for each of the Coachella area, different cities, as well as the Coachella area in total. So that is on there. If you're in San Bernardino, I have the high desert report as well. So that too is on there so that you, I've separated it out just so you could see what's happening for the high desert because they do kind of do their own thing. So I do have that as a piece of those reports. So, uh, Let's see. I think that that's about it. So I will send a copy if you want one. Thank you for tuning in. Everybody have a fantastic holiday and we'll see you on the other side of 2021 in 2022. And uh, peace, everybody. And Merry Christmas. Uh, happy holidays. Uh, happy Hanukkah. Just know that uh, my heart's the right place and wishing you a lot of love and happiness and great memories during this holiday season. And once again, I'd like to say Merry Christmas and lots of love to my family who supported me through all this. And also a special thank you to Kevin Buddy for his continued support. Thank you very much. And we'll see you next.